Well, we've almost made it to that final section where we will see uh, the glorious picture of the home that awaits all those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, those who are sealed by Him. But before we get to that glorious final picture, uh, we are given a description of the final victory of the Lamb over evil. Uh, as always in these videos, I encourage you just to stop the video, read the passage if you haven't done that yet, uh, read it a few times, read and reread, look for repetition, look for important ideas that come out of this text. Look what it tells us about God and about Jesus and how he works in the world, how he's working in history. And spend some time praying that God, by his spirit, would help you to understand this part of his word to us. Also, if you're new to this channel, I encourage you to subscribe. I do videos like this for every passage that I preach. Like this video and share it with others who you think might find this helpful. Now, this second half of chapter 19 uh, gives us another picture of Jesus. We've seen Jesus in chapter 1 as the victorious one. I called this section, The Lamb Wins. Even though the lamb who we met in chapter 5 of Revelation isn't necessarily the one in view here, this is another description of Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And here we see Jesus the lamb pictured as a rider who's called faithful and true. And we're going to see that he judges. Uh, his eyes are blazing like fire, which we saw in chapter 1. Uh, he has a name written on him, the Word of God, who we saw in John chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. Uh, this is the same writer writing this book of Revelation. And we see that uh, he's dressed in this robe dipped in blood. Again, it's a picture of the judgment uh, that is coming to all those who stand against him. He'll judge them with the sword coming out of his mouth, which, which he'll strike down the nations. He'll rule them with an iron scepter. It's another uh, reference to Psalm 2. Again, it's just so important to see that uh, the Old Testament needs to be what helps us to understand this book of Revelation. Are we not to read Revelation through uh, the lens of whatever news channel you follow or newspaper you read. We need to read Revelation through the lens of the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament in general. We're also going to be told about those who reign with Christ. Jesus, the Lamb, is the central figure in the whole of Revelation. The judgment we see uh, rolling out from chapter 6 onwards is the judgment that is contained on the scroll in chapter 5 that only the Lamb is worthy to open. He's been executing judgment and here we see the final victory as the Lamb wins. Uh, all those who stand opposed to God, we saw society, Babylon standing opposed to God in the previous section and here we are going to see all the enemies of God being uh, fully and finally dealt with by the Lamb who wins. As I said, an important part of this section is the fact that uh, Jesus is judging. Uh, we see here this sharp sword with which he'll strike down the nations. He'll rule them with an iron scepter. They're all descriptions of judgment. And his robe is dipped in blood. Again, it's not a pretty picture, that one. This is picking, picking up on prophecy from uh, Isaiah 63, is 1 to 6. This is picking up on Psalm 2, ruling with justice. Uh, it's picking up on uh, Isaiah 11. So judgment is in view here with this sword coming out of his mouth, the word of God, the word of judgment here. And the final picture is of everyone being judged according to what they've done. In this big picture, though, we do see um, those who are safe, the armies of heaven. Uh, they are dressed in white, clean linen, uh, which is 
a picture we saw in the earlier chapters, uh, back in uh, chapter 19, verse 8, and then all the way back in chapter 7, verse uh, 14, uh, the redeemed of the Lord, those who the Lamb has saved, are dressed in linen, white and clean. So these are the armies of heaven here, uh, riding out with Jesus, his army. They are those who are given authority to judge along with the Lamb. Uh, they are the souls of those who have been uh, beheaded. They hadn't worshipped the beast. And here we get another of the blessings in, in Revelation. And something else we've seen consistently in Revelation, this shift between uh, a heavenly view and an earthly view. And right here we're being given um, a view of uh, these scenes from heaven. We also see uh, God Almighty, it's His wrath that Jesus is pouring out. He is the King who we saw on the throne uh, back in chapter 4. A few other characters who uh, are making a reappearance here, the Beast who we met in chapter 13. And those who have the mark of the beast. And uh, the false prophet, uh, who is the same as the, the beast from uh, the sea, who we saw in chapter 13 as well. The last section talks about the book of life, um, as opposed to these other books. And then just one more tool to look out for uh, in Revelation. I, what he saw or what he heard are worth looking out for. And we're told in this section a number of times uh, what he saw. We're also told a few times about the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Calls here the second death. See, God's people are protected from that second death. And then, what most people are really interested in in this section is this thousand years. Sadly, uh, these verses that mention this thousand years uh, have become incredibly divisive within the church and throughout church history. And I am approaching this with an amillennial uh, perspective. So I'm not a pre-mill or a post-mill. Uh, the millennium is just another word for the thousand years. And when I say I'm amillennial, it doesn't mean that I don't believe in a thousand years, but I believe that this thousand years is symbolic. And I believe it is symbolic of the time that we are living in right now. And I'm going to do my best now just to uh, show why I say that and one of the reasons is uh, what we see here this a uh, dragon the ancient serpent uh, who is Satan is bound for a thousand years and thrown into the abyss now some some holds to the point that this uh, binding and casting down of Satan is going to be an event that happens sometime in the future I don't think that is uh, how we should understand this. I think this thousand years is symbolic of the time that we're living in now, the last days between Jesus' ascension into heaven and his return. And I think that this binding of Satan happened when Jesus first came. And Matthew 12 verse 29 is one passage that helps us to see that. Uh, we can also go uh, to Luke 10, uh, where the 72 arrive back from their uh, mission and we, Jesus says, I saw Satan cast down. Um, in John 12, verse 31 to 32, we also hear now is the time for Satan to be cast down. So I believe that this uh, seizing, binding, throwing down of Satan happened uh, when Jesus first came at the cross, Satan was bound and cast down. Now, that doesn't mean that he now has no power at all, but his power is limited. 
we see that um, the gospel is advancing, but it's advancing in a way now that it didn't advance before Jesus came. Uh, God's people, the, the Israelites, were his, his specific special people and the nations around Israel were being deluded by Satan. But when Jesus came, he said, now the nations will be reached with this message. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That can happen because the dragon has been cast down. He's been bound. He's in the abyss. Now, we saw in the abyss or from the abyss in chapter 9, we saw uh, Satan sending out his demonic horde, which means that his activities are not completely destroyed, but they are curbed. They aren't at their full force. Now, we'll see just now that one day uh, Satan will be released and he'll have one final stand but he'll be thrown into uh, the the lake of burning sulfur and it really isn't much of a stand at all um so i don't hold to the view that this thousand years is some golden age of the church sometime in the future i think the golden age for god's people is coming in chapters 20 and 21 of revelation when jesus returns and God's people will be with him forever, not just for a golden age and then go to be with him forever. They'll be with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. And this is a point that we can agree to disagree on. Um, so in the comments, you might want to come back with uh, your view on the thousand years and we can have a Christian conversation about that. But I don't want this to be something that divides us. We can agree to disagree on this. But what we do need to see, the real encouragement from this section, is that the Lamb wins. And those who we see here, those who have been beheaded, those who died as Christians during this uh, final days, during these uh, last days on earth, they are with Jesus forever. We, we're told here the souls of those who had been beheaded. And then we're told here about the first resurrection. Now, I understand that to be uh, the resurrection of the souls of those who have died in these last days, being with God right now, just as Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So the souls of those who have died because of Jesus are resurrected, uh, not a bodily resurrection yet, that's coming in chapters 21 and 22, when God's people are raised bodily to be with him forever in the new creation. But until that day, the souls of those uh, who have died because of Jesus, uh, Christians who have died, will be with him uh, forever, safe, uh, ruling with him, judging with him. We see here, they'll be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him. And that's a picture of kind of a kingly rule. Uh, so it's a real encouragement for God's people in these last days, knowing that Christians who have died are safe with Jesus uh, until that day when they return with Jesus to the new heaven and the new earth, when they will get their resurrection bodies. But when these last days, this thousand years, uh, which, as I've said, is symbolic of the days between Jesus' ascension into heaven and his return, when they come to an end, Satan will be released not for a long time. He'll be released just to gather all those who have remained opposed to God. He'll gather them for a final uh, showdown, as it were. And we see here in chapter 9 this, this innumerable uh, force marching across the earth and surrounding the camp of God's people, uh, the city he loves. Now, I don't think that's the earthly city of Jerusalem. It's symbolic of God's people being safe with him. And we see straight away, but fire came down from heaven and devoured him. There's no battle at all. Uh, God wins with ease. We saw that here as well as they were waging war, but the beast was captured. These bats, but the beast was captured, the false prophet with him. There is no war in the end. The lamb wins. The final victory is won with ease. And just as the beast and the false prophet were thrown into this lake of burning sulfur, which we're told here is the second death, a place of uh, forever torment. So it's an ongoing forever judgment. The beast and the false prophet were thrown into that lake of burning sulfur. 
And here we see the devil is thrown into that lake of burning sulfur too. And so all those enemies who stand opposed to God will one day be dealt with forever. And right at the end, we see that death itself is thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. So uh, that great enemy, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then anyone whose name is not in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. So that final, terrible, eternal judgment uh, will one day come. The final victory of the Lamb, when all those who stand opposed to God and His people will be uh, sent to their forever punishment. And we're told here at the end that it's anyone whose name is not in the book of life. Anyone whose name is not in the book of life will face this judgment. And this final section should really urge us that we want to make sure that on that day when the books are opened, the book containing everything every person on the planet has ever done, when we are judged according to what we've done, we need to make sure that our names are in the book of life. And that means that we need to be on the side of him who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We need to be those who have been sealed by the blood of the Lamb. So when those books are opened, Jesus will say he or she won't be judged according to what is in their book because he faced that wrath for us and our names then get put into his book. So although this chapter has been massively divisive around these six verses, which is the only place in the whole Bible that uh, this thousand years is mentioned, Although this has been so divisive, it's actually this section is meant to be really encouraging to us. The souls of those who have died trusting Jesus are with him now. Satan and all evil will one day be fully and finally never to return. They will be defeated. And if your name is in the Lamb's book of life, then hold on because the best by far is yet to come. And this final victory points us to the next two chapters where we will see our final home and it is more glorious than you can dream and so this passage really does challenge us is your name in this book or will you be judged according to your book and then thrown into the lake of fire you don't want that to happen it's a ghastly picture and it's ghastly on purpose this picture of vultures circling and eating the flesh of all people who stand opposed to God is an awful picture. But it doesn't have to be your destiny if your name is in the Lamb's book of life. So we need to be a people who are trusting in Jesus and rejoicing in Jesus and what he's done to get our names into his book. Well, God bless as you dig in further to this chapter. And I pray that it would encourage you and prepare you for the picture that the next section will show us of our final home.